Today, we're going to start into the Jehovah's Witnesses, and um, there's uh, a lot of really ridiculous things here as well. Um, I meet lots and lots of people who claim that they're Jehovah's Witnesses, and so you get all kinds of uh, weird responses. Usually, uh, what I've noticed, uh, knocking on doors, uh, knock on a door, and if they're Jehovah's Witness, usually they will say, uh, oh, I'm Jehovah's Witness. You know, as if that's supposed to just stop the argument. I mean, right there, that's the end of story. Leave me alone. I'm dedicated. I know what I believe. That's what they're trying to say, you know. So you invite them to church. Oh, no, I'm Jehovah's Witness. You know, nobody else does that very much. You know, if they're whatever, you know, you ask them if they go to church somewhere, then they'll tell you. But um, you run Jehovah's Witness. So they're, they're very quick to say, I'm Jehovah's Witness. That means shut up, leave me alone. I already know what I believe. So we're going to see today, and if you've already read about them, great, but uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, not only we're going to today mostly look at their background and where they came from. They're not quite as loony, and a lot of their, they're still very loony but they're not quite as loony as the Mormons. But we'll look at their background and maybe get into the uh, theology a little bit, and then next week we'll cover the rest of their theology. Okay? So we'll spend uh, two days dealing with the JFWs, Jehovah's False Witnesses. Okay? So they are, is that what you got on there? Jehovah's False Witnesses. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the day. Help us as we uh, study to know the truth. Help us to recognize it and to uh, believe it and to stand on it. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us your word that we can count on. And I pray, God, that you'd help us to be uh, true witnesses for you. Pray that you bless this day in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me mention several introductory things about the Jehovah's Witnesses. Just some very general things about them as a group. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we've all seen, uh, as you're out, you know, because we get out in the community, we knock on doors too and things. Uh, so you've seen them out many, many times. Um, I don't know how they get anywhere. As slow as they walk, <laughs> right? And I just, I always laugh at them because, I mean, they're barely moving. And they've got like six people on a half a block stretch. You know, they're both going all, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know how, I don't understand their system. But they are slow and inefficient. Um, anyway, they spend uh, a lot of time witnessing, as their name identifies them, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. They, who knows, th these are some little bit old numbers. I haven't seen numbers from the last couple of years, but they have uh, about a million people, they claim, witnessing on a regular basis. Now, what that means, you know, what is regular, once a week, uh, once a month, I don't know, but I believe it's, they claim once a week. Um, but there's, uh, they, anyway, they spend a lot of time witnessing and knocking on doors, selling. Now, they have, they, they've come under fire, under attack for this, so they've started having a few free pamphlets but most of their stuff for years, for years and years, it was all sold. Now they would sell things. We've had people, Jehovah's Witnesses, come by our farm way out in the middle of nowhere trying to sell us the Watchtower uh, literature, uh, which is the name of their uh, main publishing company. Anyway, their churches aren't what we think of as churches. They call them Kingdom Halls, the Kingdom Hall. So they believe in the coming of a kingdom, of course, and the 144,000 uh, that are part of the sheep, uh, they claim, and of course they all want to be a part of the 144,000. They didn't used to have a problem with that. When uh, the founders of this cult, when they started, they claimed that there was 144,000. It was easy to say that because uh, the return of Christ was supposed to happen within a couple of years of that time. So if we have 144,000 of us in a couple of years, we'll be doing real good. And that's going to fit right in with the Bible. It's easy to explain away. But 
Of course, the Lord didn't return in uh, 1914. He didn't return in 1915. Didn't return in 1918 or 1925 or whatever these other dates are. They've got them all scattered out. And so as the Lord didn't return, now they have way more than 144,000. So they had to come up with a new theology to explain away why there's more than 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. So anyway, uh, but the, they have, instead of churches, they have what they call kingdom halls. They believe in the coming of the kingdom and so on. Um, whenever, I don't have the number, I don't think. What's the size of a, oh, there it is. I do have it. They, they're... Kingdom halls never grow to more than 200 in uh, membership. If there's more than 200, then they'll branch off and they'll, the, the, the group will pay to build another kingdom hall. So there are, I know of one, two, I know of several just on the north side of 94 in Gary. Okay, there's one up on 11th Ave, there's one at like uh, 18th and uh, Grant, somewhere back in towards, uh, towards Harrison Street there. Anyway, so uh, Kingdom Halls, that's their church, as they would call it. <clears throat> their membership, uh, several, they, they uh, y'all show you a clip or a part of a, a video, I believe I can get to it today, um, where they had 3 million in uh, 19... 78 or something like that. Today they're around 6 million. Okay, so they've grown uh, a lot in size. Um, they have their own translation of the Bible. What's their translation of the Bible called? Okay. Thank you. The New World Translation. They have their own translation. Um, they spend most of their time, however, in, in studying religion and their doctrines. They have studying the Watchtower uh, publications. Watchtower publications. They're required to attend five hours of meetings every week. Five hours of meetings. <clears throat> this is a statistic that they love to brag about. In 1961, they spent 100, 132 million hours witnessing. 132 million hours witnessing that year. Of course, when you walk at the rate of 0 .001 miles an hour... <laughs> Uh, you, it takes a long time to witness to a whole block. <laughs> so you get a lot of time witnessing in. Um, today they have over 15 million pieces of literature that they hand or that they distribute every year. 105 million magazines have gone out. Um, so they distribute huge numbers, huge amounts of literature. Anybody know where the Watchtower Publications is located? New York City. Thank you, Mr. New York. Uh, New York City, downtown. Okay. Uh, from the beginning, they've had a wealthy financier that uh, really uh, kept them afloat and actually really pushed them to make a lot of money. <clears throat> All right, so there's also huge numbers of uh, members outside the United States. Okay, so they've, they've uh, done a great job at getting missionaries out. If you go to um, pretty much anywhere around the world, well, most places around the world, Africa, uh, they've been affected huge by, by Jehovah's Witnesses. You go to, you know, lot, most places, I'd say like the, the far southeast a Asia and so on, a lot of that hasn't been hit as much, but about anywhere else, you go to South America, Central America, anywhere else, you've got a lot of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses there. All right, so let's talk about the uh, founders of the Jehovah's Witnesses. There's, there's two main guys that we're going to look at today. Anybody remember or anybody know who the first one is? Who is the guy who started the Jehovah's Witnesses? 
All right, you don't know. All right, here we go. Charles, Taz, or Taze, the Tasmanian devil. <laughs> Charles Taze Russell. <clears throat> All right. T-A-Z Russell. All right, he is um, known as the founder. He was born in 1852, and he died in 1916. 1852 to 1916. He's born near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He uh, was born to, uh, his parents were Presbyterians. <clears throat> February 16th. Wow. We're almost to celebrate his birthday here. Isn't that exciting? No, maybe not. February 16th. Anyway, he was born to uh, Presbyterians. Uh, he entered a clothing business with his father when he was 15 years old. Oh, let's see here. I'm trying to see when he left that clothing business. I don't have the date of that. Anyway, he uh, entered the clothing business. I forget how old he was. He was a young man when he turned his back on the clothing business that his father had given him, and, and he went out uh, into this work full time. Of course, it was a very, uh, um, even financially, it was very rewarding work, of course, selling all of this stuff. And by the way, any time that people, well, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but, but this, whole, this whole system, the whole cult, is built around the idea of the return of Christ and the second advent. And any time you talk about that, there's huge interest in that. Just the way it is. Ask, uh, who's the guy camping, Harold Camping from a couple years ago? Uh, and, and 50 years before that, maybe 1,000 years before that, the guy's so old. Um, but uh, Harold Camping, ask any of these guys who have really gotten into these things, the the Seventh-day Adventists, uh, the Millerites in the 1840s, 30s and 40s. I mean, there's always, it's a huge promotion. Jack Van Impe, the end times. Man, people just love that stuff. And because it's intriguing. My kids are already interested. You know, they want to know what's going to happen in the end times. Well, anytime we talk about it, you know, their eyes get real big. And they're really, I mean, it's just natural. And, and when, when you've got a guy here... Praying, I believe, P-R-E-Y, praying on people's fears and, and interest to make money. There's money involved in it. I mean, it's just as simple as that. His religious background, he joined the Congregational Church, but he was very skeptical about some of the doctrines in the Bible, especially predestination, which he at that time, thought was in the Bible. Of course, the Bible teaches predestination, but not in the terms of the Calvinist idea of predestination. Um, If you want to have that discussion sometime, uh, you can have it at a different time, but not now. Uh, But the Bible uses the word numerous times. Uh, Predestined, okay? It's in the Bible. It's just, (laughs) it has its meaning, not uh, not, uh, Calvin's meaning. But anyway, the, the doctrine of predestination and the other doctrine that's related to it is the doctrine of hell. He could not come to grips with the idea of hell. And so he was very skeptical. By the time he was 17 years old, he was denying the authority of the Bible. <clears throat> 17 years old. Listen to this. This is a quote from his writing. He says, I was brought up a Presbyterian indoctrinated from the catechism and being naturally of an inquiring mind, I fell prey to the logic of infidelity as soon as I began to think for myself. But that which at first threatened to be the utter shipwreck of faith in God and the Bible was by God's providence overruled for good and merely wrecked my confidence in human creeds and systems of Bible misinterpretations. So I was brought to the truth. I rejected all of the other religion and theology of man, and I took on the, the true teaching of Jehovah God. 
That's from uh, the Watchtower, uh, 1916, pages 170 and 71. All right, let me just give you some of the things here real quickly. I'm going to show you a video. I'm really going to try to anyway, so let me go rather quickly. I'm going to try to show you a video that better just goes through real quickly his, his and the background of the, of the cult. He visited a second Adventist meeting in 1870, and he said, That reestablished my wavering faith in the divine inspiration of the Bible. Really? He organized a six-member Bible study from 1870 to 1875. He found others who were disappointed with Adventism based on the invisible return of Christ. He claimed that Christ returned to the earth in 18, I forget, 1891, I think. But it was an invisible return. An invisible return. Um, now, you've got to understand, in the 1840s through about 1915, there were a lot of Adventists who believed in the return of Christ to the extent that they would set dates. And, of course, he didn't come back. Over and over and over and over and over again. William Miller with the Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, when we get to that part, we'll see uh, how he came to some of those ridiculous numbers. But 1843, well, that was the first really big one. And it didn't happen, of course, right? And then on and on from there, year, many times through the 1800s, and he got sucked up in it. And so finally, when it didn't happen, by 1890s, he found a good date of 1915. And you'll see in the video how he came to that date. It's amazing. Really, really inspiring. You'll, you'll like it. He wrote a pamphlet. He wrote a pamphlet called The Object and Manner of the Lord's Return, and 50,000 copies were printed. <clears throat> he met a man named Nelson Barber of Rochester, New York. See there? And this man, he was leading a group of disgusted Adventists who also believed the spiritual, invisible second coming story. And... Uh, <clears throat> the Rochester and the Pittsburgh groups together joined to publish what they called the Herald of the Morning. It had to do with the return of Christ. See, the more you can print and sell, the more money you can make. By the way, when I was a teenager, there was a book uh, that came out, and I was 13, 12, 13, 88. I was 12. Um... 88 reasons why the rapture will take place in 1988. I think that was the actual title of the book. 88 reasons why the rapture will happen in 1988. September 11th, 12th, or 13th. Because the Bible says you can't set a date. So they gave you three dates. And I remember waking up the morning of the 14th. I remember very clearly. I was on the tractor heading back to the field to feed the cows in the back field. And I said... It's September 14th, and it didn't happen. That's my first experience with someone who set a date like that. All right, and lots of writings, by the way. In 1877, um, there's a pamphlet called Three Worlds or Plan of Redemption, and uh, they explain that Christ's second coming began in 1874, and it set forth 1914 as the end of the Gentile times. 1914. Wow. What happened in 1914? World War I. I'm telling you, man. That fit in perfectly with his theology. Except that the Lord didn't return. That was all that happened. You know, and not that's all. That's all that happened. World War I began. Anyway, Russell, uh, Charles Taz Russell, later broke with Nelson Barber. Barber began to teach that Christ's death wasn't a ransom price for Adam and his race. Well, anyway, he didn't agree with that. So he began to publish in 1879 his own magazine. Is not magazine? His own. Uh, 
uh, publication, whatever, called Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence. That was the first original name of it, the Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence. By 1880, 36 congregations had formed in seven states as a result of the publications. These are his earlier printings, and then the Zion's Watchtower in 1879. By 1880, had 36 congregations. <clears throat> they were established as an unincorporated body in 1881. By 1884, December 13, 1884, he got the legal charter for Watchtower Society purpose. And what that is, the Article 2 of the charter was, quote, the dissemination of Bible truths in various languages by means of the publication of tracts, pamphlets, papers, and other religious documents, and by use of all other lawful means. So, they were going full blast into the printing ministry. By 1886, Charles Taz Russell had published the first of seven doctrinal books. You can get those seven books now in one volume called Studies in the Scriptures by Charles Taz Russell. Studies in the Scriptures. You can find that. And this is that studies in the scriptures, in that he claims that you cannot study the Bible properly without those books. Studies in the scriptures. So I want you to know that I have decided the same thing. Okay? Uh, I have a new book coming out. No, I'm kidding. But you cannot study the Bible unless you have my interpretation of the Bible. If you do that, you'll be led off into... Uh, into heresy. Okay, that's, that's what he said. Studies in the Scriptures. So by 1886, he had the first one published. It was called The Divine Plan of the Ages. <laughs> All right. It started, as far as his publication, it started uh, headquartered in Allegheny, Pennsylvania in 1889. For about 20 years it was there. In 1903, the European branch was formed. 1904, an Australian branch. In 1908, there's a key date for you. The next guy that we'll look at soon, Joseph Franklin Rutherford, who was a very wealthy man in, uh, in New York City, He uh, bought, bought, he obtained the property, yes. He bought the property in Brooklyn, New York. <clears throat> in 1909, the People's Pulpit Association of New York was incorporated. That's a uh, publication of messages preached by Charles Taz Russell and uh, by Rutherford and then by a bunch of, of later Jehovah's Witnesses a bunch of sermons being published. Um, they knew how to make money. Okay, it's as simple as that. Uh, they, they got a, a very significant message, the return of Christ, and specific dates they set, and then they really just preached this stuff and published all of it and made lots of money on it. Now, without going into too much detail, let me tell you a little bit about the character of Charles Taz Russell. What was he like? I just want to point out to you several things, yes, that defame his character. Okay? He said uh, that he had 3,000 copies of his sermons sent out every week. By the way, you'll see that later on that they were, they were sued numerous times for their lies and um, under oath Ah, sorry, not under oath. Um, uh, by, by way of investigation, it was proved that uh, he was not sending out anywhere close to 3,000 sermons. In other words, not nearly that many people were, in, were interested in his messages. It might have been 50, a very small number of his, uh, yes, of his messages, copies, were being sent out. Not 
3,000 a week, as he claimed. Anyway, that's one thing. Let me point out several other things. The Brooklyn Daily Eagle, a newspaper, printed a story. Well, let me give the background. Charles Taz Russell traveled a lot. And one of his trips, he went to Honolulu, Hawaii. Of course, on their, you know, because he's rich, he can. Uh, he went to Honolulu and he supposedly preached a huge, to a huge crowd of people there, he claimed. And a very, he had copies of that sermon made and sent all over to all of his followers. And uh, they claim, he made all these big claims of all these people that were converted and all of these things. Well, anyway, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, a newspaper, printed a story that proved that Russell lied about a Honolulu sermon that he never preached. He went to Honolulu on vacation. There was no sermon there. There was no meeting. There was no gathering. They took a bunch of information from Hawaii, proving there was nothing there. They ne no newspaper there talked about it. There, was, there were no bookings for big uh, meetings, no bookings for big buildings, nothing of the kind. That was the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. Here's another funny story. He had, uh, he was, uh, I've seen some, uh, some funny little clips of the middle 1800s of these Adventist type preachers. And they would, uh, to me, they're kind of the forerunner of the, the modern Pentecostal movement. You know, and the blessing the hankies and then passing out these hankies or bless who knows what all. And then, you know, selling it and so on, you know, like, uh, like uh, Robertson and some of these modern Pentecostal preachers do. Well, anyway, Charles Taz Russell would travel around and he had this miracle wheat that he was selling. Miracle wheat. Um... He, uh, he claimed that the miracle wheat would grow many, many, many times uh, more than regular wheat. And so he sold it for more money. <laughs> Selling wheat. All right, the miracle wheat had been prayed over, it had been blessed, and God was blessing. Anyway, they, uh, ex they'd brought this wheat, they, there was a lawsuit brought, and they brought some wheat into the courtroom and examined the wheat. And of course, this is in the late 1800s. I mean, they didn't know that much about, uh, you know, the biology of it and so Biology? No, that's the wrong word. Anyway. Sorry? I can't remember the right word for it. Anyway. The botany. Thank you. They didn't know much about the botany of wheat and so on, the plants. But anyway, they, they examined it compared it to other wheat, you know, normal wheat versus miracle wheat, there was no difference in the wheat. And so they, they wrote a big article uh, discussing the counterfeit miracle wheat being sold by the flaming evangelist. All right, so that's some funny things there about uh, his character. A lot of things like that came about. In 1879, he was married to a woman named... Maria Frances Ackley. She served for years as the first secretary of treasurer, then associate editor of the Watchtower. She sued for divorce in 1913. So she divorced him on this basis. And this is quote, in quote, she said, or, or the reason was, conceit, which is whatever. Most women think men are conceited probably, right? Right, girls? Lorena's not going to say anything today. <laughs> Conceit, egotism, domination, and improper conduct in relation to other women. Whoops, end quote. That's Charles Taze Russell. That's 1913. In June of 1912, listen to this, there was a Baptist preacher named J.J. Ross. 
Sounds like a good Baptist preacher's name, doesn't it? J.J. Ross. Yes. He published a pamphlet about Charles Taz Russell denouncing him. <clears throat> Charles Russell turned around and sued Pastor J.J. Ross for libel, lying about him. Well, in that pamphlet, one of the main things that Pastor J.J. Ross accused Russell of doing was in his translating work into the New World Translation, in that translating work, of, he accused Russell of not actually even knowing Greek. And Russell, of course, for years, I say of course, Russell for years had, had claimed that he knew Greek. So in court, as the, okay, he's suing J.J. Ross. Ross turned around and said, okay, here's some Greek, read it. <clears throat> um, he couldn't read the Greek alphabet when it was laid in front of him. He said he was ordained by a religious organization in court. There was absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever. He called himself a pastor. He was never ordained. I'm not, you know, I'm not huge on, oh, I guess I am. The Bible talks ordination, but... I'm saying he, he claimed he was ordained by a religious organization and then later admitted that he never was ordained by a religious organization. Okay, so he's got some problems. He's a liar. All right, any questions on Charles, the Tasmanian devil, Russell? Okay, let's move on. Joseph Franklin Rutherford. Joseph. Franklin Rutherford. <clears throat> All right, we'll go quickly. He became the official leader in January of 19... Oh, by the way, Charles Taze Russell, he died in 1916, as you saw in the, uh, his life date. He died after 1914 when he had announced the return of Christ. It didn't happen. He moved it to the next year. It didn't happen. 1916, he died. Okay, so he forgot to announce his own end. <clears throat> before the return, the, before the end of the world. Anyway, Joseph Franklin Rutherford became the official leader in January of 1917. So that's about 100 years ago, next January. Um, he was born in Michigan. Joseph Franklin Rutherford. Oh, yes. He later called himself, when he became the head, what's that? When he became the head, he called himself Judge Rutherford. Judge. He claimed that he, you know, he just called himself a judge. Now, he was a lawyer. He had been to law school. Um, but he called himself a judge. Judge Rutherford. <laughs> so... In 1894, he was contacted by society representatives. In 1906, he joined. In 1907, he became the legal secretary. In 1917, he became the head, the leader of the, the Watchtower Society. Let me point out to you several things that he did early, early on while he was leading. I'm not going to go through his whole life story, but point out several things that he did as the leader of the Jehovah's Witnesses. <clears throat> by the way, when you're talking to Jehovah's Witnesses, it's not bad at all to bring them to their history. You'll see after watching this video, their, their, their history is just full of false prophecies and lies. And, I, you know, again, I said the same thing with the Mormons. You seriously believe that? But maybe they have a burning of the bosom also, and they just know that it's true. Well, no matter what the truth is, they know it's true. Anyway, what did he do? He, he encouraged more witnessing. Uh, the dissatisfaction in society and leadership led to the formation of schisms in the Jehovah's Witnesses. So there were many schismatic groups. <clears throat> he was uh, very controversial. You know, he was, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He was, anyway, he, was, he, he caused divisions. He was divisive, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. 
the first six books of the, of the volume, Studies in the Scriptures, the first six were written by, were written by Charles Taze Russell. The seventh one was written by Judge Rutherford. <clears throat> and the title of that seventh book was called The Finished Mystery. <sighs> See, catching. I mean, just, right, you're all right there already, I can tell. <clears throat> yes, we should do that. Because you can't study the Bible uh, properly without it. So you really need it. Um, another one of those studies in the Scripture, another one of those books, I don't have it down which one it is, but another one's called The Fall of Babylon. Oh, you know, so it's just, you know, everything's like this, just really catchy and, and it's all good. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, he's the head, 1917. What's going on in the world? World War I, 1914 to 1919. Okay? He's right in the middle of it. And uh, what's one of the major beliefs of the Jehovah's Witnesses? Yes? Uh, I know they disliked the government greatly, so maybe they were against the war, probably. Absolutely. Absolutely. They are against going to war. Okay, so he's got a big problem. United States is in the middle of World War I, and he's got a big problem. And he, <clears throat> he insisted that anybody who was a Jehovah's Witness refuse to go to war. All right. The Catholic and Protestant religious organizations together form present Babylon, he said. And uh, with the, anyway, with the war, and, uh, the war effort in the United States, it led to legal action for anti-war sentiment. His pamphlets were made illegal in Canada in February of 1918. Canada outlawed his pamphlets. Why? Because he told them not to go to war. Canada was trying to build up for the war effort. In May of 1918, warrants were issued by the U.S. District Court of Eastern New York for the arrest of eight of the society's leaders, including Rutherford. So he's got a jail problem. <laughs> what did they charge him with? Conspiracy to cause insubordination and refusal of duty in U.S. voluntary and naval forces. He was found guilty on Ju in June, and each of the eight leaders were sentenced to 20 years at Federal Pen in Atlanta, Georgia. That's June of 1918. Well, in 1919, the war ended. Oh, before, I'm getting ahead of myself. The Brooklyn headquarters actually closed down. Operations continued at the Pittsburgh office for... Uh, this time, it was about a year, actually less than a year that they spent in jail. Petitions were made after the war for their release. Uh, May of 1819, they were released. The convictions were reversed, and America was out of the war, and uh, Rutherford was out of jail. <laughs> All right. Um, emphasis changed in 1920 from Bible study to witnessing and propaganda. <clears throat> in 1931, they adopted their name that they presently go by, the Jehovah's Witnesses. 1931. See, the emphasis changed from mostly Bible study to more witnessing. And Rutherford began to write books like crazy, magazines, I uh, mentioned a couple of them. The Golden Age magazine. Doesn't it all sound, oh, yeah, the Golden Age. What's the, what's the main picture that you think of when you think of the Jehovah's Witnesses? If you've ever seen their literature. Anybody know? Oh, come on. When you're knocking on a door and you see it in the door, right? I've done this many times. What is it? Uh, yeah. Okay, that's the watchtower. It looks like a tower. That's what you're thinking of. They had a really, I think I remember out in Gary, there was a 
whole bunch of them. They're all very brightly colored. They'll say, uh, we have this going on. Sure. And all this is going to happen. Okay. Well, that's a little different direction I'm heading in, but still. Uh, generally, what they do is they, they show this beautiful picture of a very peaceful Eden, Garden of Eden-like setting. And in that picture, almost always, I've always seen, is a lion and a child sitting there in the meadow playing together. Peace, the, the kingdom of God coming to the earth. The Golden Age. Rutherford wrote a book called The Harp of God. <laughs> All of these things, are, you know, they're made for publishing. That's about it, you know. Um, the Bulletin, The Watchtower and Constellation, on and on. <clears throat> World War II comes along. And their policy of neutrality was reaffirmed. Of course, in World War II... Um, uh, was it a draft? I forget exactly. There was a draft. World War II. Um, but not for ministers, I believe. Well, anyway. <coughs> excuse me. What the Jehovah's Witnesses did is they made all their male men ministers. They made them all ordained ministers. Um, <coughs> so... From uh, 1939 to 1945, their number of ministers more than doubled. <laughs> of course, that was in name only. Um, but a lot of them, uh, a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses did not become men, did not become ministers, and they didn't go to the war. 3,500 were imprisoned for not going to war. In 1943... Joseph Rutherford died. Middle of the uh, first guy dies in the middle of World War One. The next guy dies in the middle of World War Two. <clears throat> All right, let me just mention there was a third uh, leader, not like the first two, but the third one is a guy named Nathan Knorr, K N O R R. Uh, 1942, actually it was 42 when he died, not 43. In 42 when uh, Rutherford died, Knorr took over and um, he rose through the ranks in coordinating all the printing activities in 1932, 34, 1940. He's rising through the ranks and then he takes over in 1942. Uh, he also published many books, taking the, some of them took the place of Russell's books for doctrine. <clears throat> And they held, uh, while he was the head, there was huge, huge gatherings uh, around the country. They would rent out these huge buildings. One, I don't have the date here, but I believe it was in the 80s, was at Yankee Stadium. Filled the stadium with Jehovah's Witnesses, downtown New York City. So they, they love everything big and, you know, all the books and titles and publishing and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> All right, I, I, whew, okay, I, I have a little enough time to finish this section still, and then I want to show you that video. And we'll just do as much as we can. It's not, uh, uh, not, not a big deal if we don't get the whole thing in. Let me talk to you about the sources of authority of the Jehovah's Witnesses. The sources of authority. <clears throat> they make claims for several things, and of course they add to... Uh, their sources of authority, much more than the Bible. That, you know, all these groups, they all claim the Bible, but uh, they don't really believe only the Bible. <clears throat> I have down here that, that not any real statement of faith exists. They have lots of things that they believe in, but their, their uh, faith has evolved and it's continually evolving. There, there is not a real statement. The doctrines have to be examined through their publications, not one particular book. So I'll tell you several things that they claim to hold to. Okay, first, the, the Bible. <clears throat> the Bible. The Watchtower, 1951, <clears throat> in an article called, What Has Religion Done for Mankind? In that article it says, 
Quote, the holy scriptures of the Bible are the standard by which to judge all religions. Okay, so the holy scriptures. There you go. See, now you know that they stand on the Bible. Secondly, there's another book that they believe is a whole lot of their doctrine. It's a book called Let God Be True. I'll reference that in short. LGBT. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. LGBT. Let God be true. In that, <laughs> in that writing, uh, he, they claim a lot of doctrines. Let God be true in this area. Let God be true. And they go through the doctrines. Okay, I'll give you an example. We shall let God be found true by turning our readers to His imperishable written word. To let God be found true means to let God have His say to what is the truth that sets men free. It means to accept His word, the Bible, as the truth. Hence, in this book, let God be true, our appeal is to the Bible for truth. Our obligation is to back up what is said herein by quotations from the Bible for proof of truthfulness and reliability. That's pages 29 through 31 of LGBT. Uh, all right. Okay, what else do they do? Uh, they also have, oh, by the way, when they say the Bible, they're not talking about the King James Version. They're talking about the New World Translation. So, let's talk about the New World Translation a bit. <clears throat> In a book called Four Major Cults, page 238, we have this book in our library. Um, I have this written down from that book. It says, instead of, and this is about Jehovah's Witness, instead of listening to Scripture and subjecting themselves wholly to its teachings as they claim to do, they actually impose their own theological system upon Scripture and force, <coughs> force Scripture to comply with their beliefs. Beware, beware, be careful that you don't believe something and find verses to back it up. Rather, we should take the Bible and conform what we believe to the Bible. And what he does and what the Jehovah's Witnesses do is they have all these beliefs. And then they force the Bible to back it up. For example, they don't believe in Christmas trees. Okay? Well, where does the Bible say anything about Christmas trees? Well, there's a verse in the book of Isaiah that talks about the lights in the trees. Okay? So what if I put up a Christmas tree without lights? See? Anyway, so, so it, I'm sure, I'm positive, well, I'm 99.999% positive that Isaiah didn't have a Christmas tree that he was talking about there. You understand? Anyway, that's, that's my opinion. All right. They don't believe in lots of other weird stuff either. But let me mention to you several things about the New World Translation. The New World Translation is not an objective rendering of Scripture. <clears throat> it's not an objective rendering of Scripture. They don't go directly translating word for word, word for word. Um, they, they have beliefs. By the way, the New World Translation wasn't translated until much later after Charles Taz Russell already had developed all these ideas. And he believed certain things already and then forced the New World Translation to take on those beliefs. For example, Charles Taz Russell didn't believe in the Holy Spirit being a person of the Godhead. Now, as you can figure out by the name, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't believe in a trinity. They believe that there's only Jehovah God. That's it. Jesus was a good man, they say. He was a prophet. He was a good guy. But his death, the cross, is nothing more than a pagan Catholic symbol. That's not what Jesus died on, and, it's not, and it doesn't matter anyway, they say. And the Holy Spirit is not a person. He's an, an impersonal it. He's not, uh, not a person at all. And so the New World Translation has verses that uh, show that the Holy Spirit is an it. 
or they, when there's verses in the New World Translation that, or in the Bible that talk about the Trinity, maybe the New World Translation just wipes them out, like 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. 1 John 5? Yes, 1 John 5, 7 and 8. Okay, so <clears throat> give you some examples or some things that they do in distorting the teaching about several things. Uh, they distort the teaching of the Bible about God. No, I'm sorry, about the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about that first. They distort the teaching of the Bible about the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> it's the New World Translation. Distorts the teaching of the Bible about the Holy Spirit. In your Bible, and in mine, Spirit, or Holy Spirit, is often capitalized. Right? In the New World Translation, it is never capitalized. It's not capitalized because he's not a person. It is not a person in their way of saying it. Um, in our Bible, uh, in Acts chapter 5, well, here's an example. In Acts chapter 5, in Ananias and Sapphira, the spirit there is referenced as, uh, as a part of the Godhead. Uh, one, the, verse 4, it says, You lied not unto men, but unto God. I mean, it's verse 5. Uh, verse 4, it says, They lied to the Spirit. Okay, so Spirit and God are the same person. Well, they made a mistake there in the New World Translation because it's also in there. They missed that one. Um, the translation changes to prove the impersonality of the Holy Spirit can be found in John chapter 14, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Uh, Grieve not the holy, small spirit, small letter of God, whereby you're sealed in the day of redemption. Yes, Ephesians 4.30 and other places. So they change the, per the personality of the Holy Spirit. They also distort the teaching regarding Christ's deity. Remember, they don't believe in Jesus as deity. By the way, what does the verse in the first John say about uh, somebody who doesn't believe in the deity of Christ? What about uh, second, uh, is it third John, where it says, those who don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, don't let him into your house. These are an antichrist. And there's a lot of verses that talk about people who don't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. Well, they don't. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. So they don't believe in Jesus, the Word, the Son of God. Uh, Luke 2.11. <clears throat> anyway, John 20.20. 20, I don't have time to go through all these. But they don't believe in Jesus as the deity. What do they distort about the Trinity? So I mentioned the Holy Spirit, about uh, Jesus' deity, about the Trinity. Uh, they do several things in their New, New World Translation about Trinity passages in the Bible. 1 John 5, 7. These, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. That's what our Bible says. Their Bible, it's missing. 1 John 5, 7 is not there. Okay? That's how you do it. If you don't like it, you just cut it out. It's real simple. Uh, John 10, 30, uh, that's, is that I and my Father are one? I don't think so. But Jesus likens himself and the Father as one in John 10, 30. And they say that's not literally one as in God. That's one as in, in agreement. You know, like a husband and a wife. They are one in, nat in agreement and so on, not in actual being. <clears throat> First Timothy 3.16, what's that verse? God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. See, who was manifest in the flesh? Jesus, right? God, the Bible says there in 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh. Well, in the New World Translation, that first word there is not God, it's He who was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. So it's very vague in who, God, who Jesus, who is that person talking about there. All right, so Trinity passages, deity of Christ, they, they take those out or change them. 
most of the time. <laughs> most of the time. <clears throat> Here's what Russell said in his studies of the scriptures. I already mentioned this, but I'll read to you what he actually says. He said that anyone who studied only the Bible without the aid of his studies in the scriptures. You know, I just feel sorry for everybody who lived before about 1880 because they couldn't understand the Bible very much without his studies in the scriptures. He said anybody who did it without the aid of his studies in the scriptures would soon be in spiritual darkness. Yeah. That's probably why the Dark Ages came, you know, the, the Middle Ages, because they didn't have his books. Members of Jehovah's Witness organization are obligated to unconditional obedience. This obligation includes the duty of accepting the Word of God only in the interpretation offered them by the Brooklyn Publications, Watchtower Society. Watchtower Society has, divinely, has divine authority and hence possesses a monopoly on the truth. If they're the only ones that can interpret the Bible, then they have a monopoly on the truth. And on the proper proclamation of the gospel, it's forbidden to nourish oneself from other sources or to think one's own thoughts. Those who do this disregard the light which comes to them through God's channel. Yeah, what's his channel? The Watchtower publication. The Jehovah's Witnesses uh, uh, group. And they imply that the Watchtower is not sufficient for our time. Well, I don't imply it, I say it. <laughs> the Watchtower is not sufficient. Only Christ is sufficient. <clears throat> He goes on to say, this is from uh, some book, uh, 1960, uh, of their writings. They thereby commit an offense which entails disastrous consequences and are by Jehovah not reckoned as belonging to the sheep, but to the goats. Yeah, those who reject the writings of the watchtower and only stick to the Bible, they are the ones that are going to end up with the goats and not with the sheep. All right. <clears throat>